Hello and welcome back to Introduction to Business Analytics. My name is Hari Rajagopalan and I'll be your instructor for this session. So we are almost towards the end of regression, the first part of predictive ana analytics. And we've got more modules in predictive analytics, but regression is the first and the biggest part of it. And we are going to talk about nonlinear regression. So before we get into nonlinear regression, let's discuss what's the difference between re linear regression and nonlinear regression. In linear regression, all terms are a constant. The parameter is multiplied by an independent variable. And so you have something like this. Dependent variable is equal to intercept or constant plus parameter one multiplied by independent variable and so on until you finish with all the independent variables and each independent variable has its own unique parameter. Now, you also have linear regression, but you have non-linear linearity there, which we are going to talk about. And we are going to talk about in this uh, lecture about how to use that in Excel. So here we have dependent variable is constant plus parameter of an independent variable. And then we can square this independent variable, or you can use log, or you can use the inverse. Now, this is a non-linear equation. But statisticians would say it is linear in parameters, and so you can use the ordinary least, least squared method. For example, this equation here would have a U-shaped curve, and I'll talk about that. The independent variable is nonlinear, but it's linear in parameters. And then in the end, we'll talk about nonlinear models. Now, if regression does not follow any of these linear rules, it's the nonlinear model, and they can be used to fit an enormous variety of curves. Uh, however, it's difficult to do. You need sophisticated software. You really can't do it in Excel. So I'll touch upon it in this lecture, but we won't get into that. We we'll definitely use, need to use a package like R or SAS to kind of look at that. So Excel has options here. You can see the trend line options where you can do exponential, linear, logarithmic, polynomials, power, and that's basically here where they, we are doing linear regression after all. So let's talk a little bit. Nonlinear regression uh, provides greater flexibility to fit curves, and we are not talking about what you can do in Excel. Like ordinary least squared methods, nonlinear regression estimates the parameters by minimizing the sum of squared errors, but nonlinear regression uses an iterative algorithm rather than solving them with matrix equations like linear regression. And <coughs> that creates its own problems. And we'll talk about it later. You have to specify the correct functional form. You have to worry about which algorithm to use. We have to have good starting values. We have to worry about the algorithm not converging into a solution or giving us some what we call as local minimum rather than the global minimum that is get stuck somewhere. And so the best approach is to use linear regression first and figure out whether the linear model will give you an adequate fit by checking out the residual plots. And only if linear model doesn't work, then you try nonlinear models. So let's look at linear regression with nonlinear variables. Uh, here we have an example of how if, if your independent variable has a square function or it's called quadratic. So long as the values are negative, you'll see it decreasing uh, here, and then it hits zero, and then it'll increase. So this U-shaped curve is what a quadratic function looks like. And sometimes you'll only see this half of it, kind of just this going up. The next example is exponential. And exponential, as you can see here, is it's flat, and then it starts shooting up. And you can see when it's going to 10 to the power of 13, which is more than, you know, a trillion is 10 to the power of 9. So it's more than a trillion. Uh, it's, uh, it's about 10 million trillion. So it's shooting up pretty fast for an exponential distribution. So quadratic kind of increases, but gradually exponential kind of, uh, kind of and then shoots up dramatically. Um, here is an example of inverse where you have uh, one divided by the independent variable. Um, you can kind of see this, it, it drops and then it flattens out. And if it's negative, it increases and flattens out. So you can see how it goes here. A square root 
essentially is when you it kind of increases initially linearly and then it kind of gets more flat uh, and a log is also similar except a log would be the flattening will happen earlier and will shrink things faster here's a negative exponential example uh, where it kind of gets pretty close to zero very closely and finally we're looking at cubed where it goes something like this so here are different kinds of um, um, nonlinear variables let's take an example problem and see if we can um, identify something as exponential and take a look at it so here we have an example of um, we are trying to predict body fat percentage body fat and normally people use the hologic DXA whole body system and this is kind of expensive way of obtaining whole body fat so we collect data of 92 middle school girls uh, oh, sorry middle school middle school girls <laughs> I apologize uh, and you're looking at height weight and the percentage body fat using the hologic DXA whole body system now if we can use the BMI uh, by calculating using height and weight to calculate percentage body fat uh, that could give us a cheaper and easier way of doing it so let's start for like using height and weight and calculate our BMI which is already done for you and since height and weight are already being used in BMI we're not going to use height and weight to predict body fat we are just going to use BMI to predict body fat directly so you cannot use both height weight and BMI because then we get into the issue of multicollinearity and so we need to use only BMI and we can use Excel to get the full data set here so first step what I would suggest is to create a, a, a scatter plot right um, and then look at the scatter plot we can look at it from Excel and then we can do some quick and easy checks so let's go to Excel first do the scatter plot and do some quick and easy checks to see whether we're getting a linear or quadratic function so here we are in Excel um, let's select the BMI and body fat and then go ahead and do a scatter plot here so let's go ahead and select the scatter plot let's increase the size of it and this should give us a nice little big view of the diagram so right click here we can add this trend line and then we can ask to display the equation and r squared values right here so let's take a look at this so let's go look at the trend line let's click on it so we have linear is about 74.41 uh, if we do exponential it reduces so obviously this is not an exponential form let's look at logarithmic and you can see that logarithmic is actually increasing the r squared it has a better explanation right and then we can go to polynomial 76 percent this is a lot higher polynomial is better let's go ahead and see whether it's cube root uh, so we could actually check here and see how the r squared is increasing based on um, the the values here right and but whenever you do this polynomial you've got to check the first one before going in and you can you can be in the danger of overfitting so unless you've got some theory that it, it is of higher polynomial you know for sure I would suggest we stick with quadratic right now which gives us about 76 percent and that that's a good start there to look at how we're going to do it as quadratic so it does look like we are using the quadratic model uh, let's look at the different scatter plots with the trend lines we talked about this uh, and it looks like the quadratic model kind of comes out uh, pretty well let's talk about how we're going to create this quadratic function to run it on linear regression and let's look at the excel file to do that 
Once we have decided it's the quadratic model, we take each value of BMI and square it. That's the squared value, right? And so when you're running, if you're going to do a linear model, you just do um, data analysis regression. You select fat, and then you just select the BMI for the linear model. And when you want to do the quadratic model, you select both BMI and BMI squared for the quadratic model, okay? And you should be able to get your outputs, all your uh, normality plot. Uh, there's a slight curve here. This is definitely, there is some nonlinearity going on here. Probably if you get your trend line, you can see it's kind of more an exponential curve. It's a better fit than a linear curve. Um, so definitely there is not that the normality plot is showing us there is an issue. However, if you look at the residual plot, it's kind of, uh, it is kind of fine. The residual plot, it's on both sides and here is the fit. Uh, when you do the quadratic model, remember that you're running both BMI and BMI squared and you want to then build you look at the normality plot here um, you can also look at the observation order which is essentially a scatter plot where observations and residuals it looks kind of random and you can also look at residuals versus the predicted value and that's kind of random looks random so let's go back to Excel Sorry, let's go back to PowerPoint and finish up what we're discussing here in, not, in these uh, nonlinear independent variables. So here we go and we compare the two models as you can see and we can clearly see that when we look at the actual adjusted R squared, the standard error, which gives you the absolute values, you can see absolute standard error is less. This is a better fit um explaining more here we can explain about 75.52 percent whereas here the that's the adjusted r squared whereas r squared is only 74 percent so definitely a better model um, and if you look at the p values all of them are pretty significant so definitely this this should work now if you want to go look at a cubed model remember that we saw our r squared increase when we looked at the cube model but really what you want to look at is the adjusted R squared because your R squared could increase just because there are more variables. So if you want to do a cubed model, then go ahead and create BMI cubed. So we have BMI, BMI squared, BMI cubed, run it again and see whether all three, the adjusted R squared increases, whether the standard error decreases and all three R uh, P values are statistically significant. And you can continue on. You can go to a fourth function if, if you think that will give you a better fit. Um, so we are looking at the different plots here. The normal probability plot, which we saw was nonlinear, definitely. And there's a little bit of an exponential curve there. Uh, here, but here, if you look at the residuals and the observation order and the predicted, it looks fine. So this essentially kind of shows us the linear regression of with nonlinear variables. But we're going to talk about uh, linear models that use, there's a difference between linear models that uses nonlinear variables and nonlinear models. And the next set of models we're going to talk about, which we cannot do in Excel, are completely nonlinear. The parameters are nonlinear and there's a complete different set of rules. And we do need more sophisticated software than we have like R to do that. So let's take an example. Let's assume parameters given by the symbol theta. There's the Weibull distribution, which looks something like an S-shaped curve, and it looks something like this. Theta 1, parameter 1, plus parameter 2, minus parameter 1, multiplied by the negative exponential of parameter 3, and the independent variable to the power. So it looks kind of complex. The parameters are multiplying with each other. They are in the power value. And here's another one, Fourier, which can pretty much and let me show you how the here's the Fourier which kind of is kind of a messy kind of a, a set of parameters and notice that the parameters interact with each other 
and you definitely need a more sophisticated software to do these models. So when you do nonlinear models as compared to what we have done so far, which is linear models with nonlinear variables, when you do nonlinear models, there is no R squared. And let's talk about why that is so. R squared, if you remember, is the ratio of variance explains to the total variance. And then explain variance plus error variance gives you a total variance. This arrangement makes sure that R squared is always between 0 and 100%. And this math works correctly for linear regression models. But when you do nonlinear, the underlying assumptions are incorrect. Explain variance plus error variance does not add up to total variance. And this is specifically nonlinear models. R squared is valid for linear models that use polynomials for model curvature. So R squared, if you end up using R squared for nonlinear models, and sometimes software gives you that R squared, you should not use it. R squared will be consistently high for both excellent and horrible models. I mean, so even if you have a bad model, you'll have a high R squared. R squared will not rise for better models all the time. And if you use R squared to pick the best model, it will lead to the proper model only 28 to 43 percent of the time. There have been people who have done a number of simulations and runs and they found it doesn't really give you a good model. So what should you do? You should use standard error of regression or any other goodness of fit measure, which is not linear. So standard of error of regression is smaller, the better. Also for nonlinear models, your p-values are useless. You cannot use your p-values. So remember in linear models, you have all terms that are either constant or a parameter multiplied by independent variable. So you build an equation by adding the terms together. And so you will have a consistent form that allows you to create a single hypothesis test. So you can test the parameters with a hypothesis test, which gives you the p-value, right? So there is one hypothesis. Non-linear models can be any form, which gives you the flexibility because you can have any number of infinite forms, which allows, us, allows you to curve fit. But it's impossible to have a single hypothesis for all the parameters. And so the null hypothesis value for each parameter depends on the nonlinear function, the parameter's location in it, and the research question. So you really can't use p-values in nonlinear models. Overall, these nonlinear models are way beyond the scope of this introduction to business analytics. There's so much more to analytics than what I'm teaching here. Uh, so all we are going to focus on in this uh, session or in this whole module lecture, this certificate program, is the um, is the is the linear models with nonlinear variables.